I uh, indeed was the, the first surgeon who ever live streamed a surgical operation using Google Glass. Rumor that the Apple Watch the 7th edition was going to be much more uh, healthcare oriented. They really lacked the vision. They to, to be innovators, change the, the, the landscape of how we do healthcare and how we teach healthcare. We're still a, a struggling with a, a sharing an x ray a, a from a hospital a two miles away from the physician or the nurse can focus on the actual patient in front of them rather than focusing on the computer, you know, on the side. Hi. Um, it's our new episode of Digital Health Interviews, uh, and I'm really excited about our today's guest. Um, in our previous episodes, we talk mostly to startup founders, uh, board members of multiple uh, med tech and healthcare companies, consultants. All of those people were represented on the side of the business, and um, probably none of them would be able to succeed in whatever they're doing without the other part of the equation, without healthcare providers, hospitals, clinicians, doctors, administrative staff, and many others. And our today's guest is a perfect representative of a healthcare provider. He's a full-time practicing surgeon, a doctor, educator, and what is probably even more important for us today is an early tech adopter. And besides, he is a great keynote and TEDx speaker. So please welcome our today's guest, uh, Dr. Rafael Grossman. Hi, Raphael. Hello, Alex. Uh, it's good to be here. And uh, thanks again for the, for the invitation and the opportunity to engage with, uh, with uh, the other side of the equation, as you call it. Uh, it's really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could you just, in a few words, tell us a little bit about your background and what you're doing in, in life? Absolutely. My background is uh, in surgery. I'm, I'm a full-time surgeon. I do uh, a... Basically, I'm a trauma surgeon. I also do elective surgery to some degree. About a third of what I do is elective surgery, including general elective surgery, laparoscopy, robotic surgery. My main focus, though, is emergency surgery and trauma, as well as critical care. And I've been doing this for, uh, for a long time. I've been doing surgery for close to 30 years now. I'm originally from Venezuela, and I trained in the U.S. as a surgeon. And uh, have been in the U.S. Uh, for the last uh, almost uh, 18 years, uh, uh, back to the U.S. Uh, in parallel to doing that, I've been always excited about the power of technology to improve how we do things and, and what we do, especially in healthcare, how we do healthcare, how we teach, and how we learn healthcare. I'm really a bit of a, of a geek surgeon, I guess. Uh, uh, I love uh, uh, how uh, uh, technology can, can really enhance the humans. And at the same time, especially in healthcare, how technology can enhance humanity in healthcare, which is one of the things that, that we've lost over the last at least a couple of decades uh, by the uh, wrong application uh, or, or the wrong embracing of, uh, of technology. Uh, very interesting, and I'm sure we're going to get to that part a little bit later. Uh, but my first question is, so basically, it's been eight years since your famous first ever surgery using Google Glass. Uh, eight years is a lot of time in terms of technology development. Uh, could you tell us what has actually changed since uh, June 20th of 2013 until now in terms of uh, emerging technology adoption? Yes. Uh, well, I... Uh, Indeed, was the, the first surgeon who ever live streamed a, a surgical operation using Google Glass. Right back then, in the, in the year 2012, um, things uh, were a, a bit different. I think that we were still uh, discovering what uh, the potential of, of mobile technologies was, what the potential of uh, smart glasses was, and uh, uh, that was probably the first time that that an uh, augmented reality device had been used in a live surgery, a streaming live surgery a, with an AR device, which is what Google Glass really, really is. A, up to today, we have seen in, in, in very few years, uh, 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 exponential, I call it, development of uh, smart glasses, from smart glasses that just uh, stream uh, content to uh, smart glasses that can uh, do what we call extended reality, right? The, Magic Leap, uh, in, in, in the Vario XR3, the HoloLens 2, and all of those have been to some degree 
uh, applied in, in healthcare, mostly for education, but also for diagnosis and uh, lately also for therapeutics. You have companies like uh, Magic Leap and uh, Brain Lab, for example, which are uh, really breaking ground in how the XR technology can, can, can be used during surgery to enhance, to improve how surgery is done and uh, hopefully uh, to bring the outcomes to, to a better a place. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, we have been talking about the potential of these technologies to, to uh, make things better in medicine, but I think it's uh, only until very recently that we have seen a real case, a uh, use case, uh, 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 occasions. Uh, the HoloLens 2, for example, uh, is being used clinically, uh, as you know, uh, Microsoft and Philips uh, uh, Dr. Atul Gupta, for example, a cardiologist and interventional cardiologist have been using HoloLens on a clinical basis to enhance uh, that uh, interaction between the digital world that we need to in order to do medicine and uh, the actual uh, user, the actual uh, interventional uh, user. So that has been really, really exciting. So I, I think that we have uh, taken some pretty uh, giant leaps in the last, uh, I would say, three to five years. For sure, totally agree. But just one more question regarding the Google Glass. So basically, it was announced in 2012, uh, and Google was envisioning that it's going to go to the mass market, like people are going to walk on the streets, use during their work, and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, after all the criticism about privacy concerns and all that happened, uh, Basically, they changed their target audience to specific industries and healthcare is probably number one of them. Okay. So on the one hand, uh, all of the developers who were supposed to create apps all, all over the world, they kind of lost their interest because it's not a mass market product. On the other way, Google started to actually focus on healthcare specifically. So you are definitely the one who used Google Glass eight, seven years ago, and you're still using it. Has the device changed a lot? New functionality, new features, new apps. How would you how would you value the progress of this device? No, Google Glass certainly. Uh, I, I think that that uh, looking retrospectively, right, the uh, uh, initial approach on how to engage the public with this device was probably wrong. I, I'm not a you know, marketing person or business person. I'm just a surgeon. But uh, I took the opportunity to use Google Glass as it came out of the box, right, to uh, enhance how I would teach my students and how they would learn. And uh, still, inter intermittently, I, I do use a glass to to do, a, you know, similar, mostly a proof of concept uh, a, a, a scenarios. Uh, obviously, I'm not using Google Glass clinically, and uh, Google Glass uh, has evolved to some degree. You know, after the first uh, edition, there came a second edition. There was an enterprise edition, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's basically a, a very similar device than the original one. You know, it can fold and it's smaller, and uh, and uh, uh, you know, some some morphologic uh, changes more than anything else. But uh, certainly, uh, there are. Uh, uh, enterprises that are engaged with, with Google and, and uh, uh, the enterprise edition, uh, uh, as long as you have a proof of concept and a, and a, and a, and a goal, uh, something that is uh, of interest to Google, you know, they, they work with you. That, that's what I understand. I'm, I'm just a solo user. I'm not, uh, I do engage with a few companies which uh, use Google Glass in addition to, to many other devices out there now that do similar things, some better, some not. Uh, uh, so I, I work with them and I, I, I advise or, or, or try to, to prove uh, or to reinforce the clinical part. So uh, uh, I, I would say that what I like about Google Glass is that the simplistic uh, 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 design, right? I thought it was a pretty, pretty clever design. Uh, you see how devices like uh, uh, New Eyes or, or um, Epson Moverio or Vuesix, uh, the Vuesix Blade or any of the other models for Vuesix are phenomenal uh, advancements uh, compared to Google Glass in regards to the, uh, uh, the form factor and also in regards to 
to what the device can do for you. We've recently seen how, how you know, in the last week, you know, Facebook uh, came back with Ray-Ban and, and they came out with a glass that, that is, is, is a pretty cool looking glass and also has some functionality related to, to what Google Glass uh, could do. You know, they say, take pictures, take video, receive phone calls, listen to music. You know, it's pretty limited. It's certainly more a, a in general public it targeted. You have the announcement of uh, Xiaomi, the, the Chinese uh, company just uh, uh, announced that they're coming up with uh, similar glasses that have much more functionality that what uh, the Facebook uh, glasses have. So I think that is an evolving market. And, and uh, you know, Google Glass was, was just one first step. And I see it as the, as the, as the Model T almost of, 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 the, of the AR smart glass industry. You know, you have, you have now you know, Tesla models <laughs> far away just a few years after. So I think it's a, it's going at a pretty good speed in a good direction as well. Thanks. By the way, I've heard, I've seen and I've heard lots of uh, opinions of digital health experts that were not really amused by the latest Apple presentation. What do you think of that? I'm sorry, you, you said the latest what? Apple presentation with the oh, Apple Watch and iPhone. Yeah, well, I tell you, I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of an Apple fan, I have to admit it, right? And I am certainly a very early adopter of many technologies, especially if they have anything to do with, potentially with, with learning and uh, educating or teaching or healthcare. And I could not watch the, the Apple presentation, unfortunately, live because I, I was in the OR, so I was, I guess, doing something a little bit more exciting, at least to me. Sure. <laughs> but uh, I did watch parts of it, and you know, I, I was uh, not really very uh, uh, pleased, I think, or excited. I mean, not not that my opinion, you know, it counts for anything to Apple, but but I, I was really hoping, I was really hoping that, for example, a, a Apple a, with the emphasis and the focus that they've had in, in healthcare, a, you know, lately last several years, I would say, I really was thinking that in the case of a wearable device like the, like the Apple Watch, you know, I was really excited with, with all those rumors that many times, you know, are wrong, but uh, rumors that the Apple Watch uh, seventh edition was going to be much more uh, healthcare oriented in regards to, 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 to measuring maybe, uh, uh, you know, glucose levels or have uh, other sort of technology, like for example, checking blood pressure. Uh, those are things that I think would be, would be, extremely helpful, uh, you know, for the general public, uh, for enhancing digital health, uh, to really tap on the power of wearables. You know, I'm, you know, I have a Whoop device, I have an Aura Ring, I have an Apple Watch, and these are things that I use myself uh, because I, I, I believe that the data that I can gather from those devices can help my health, uh, but mostly because I I'm involved in a few projects that require me to be using this, and, you know, in, in any case, I, I was really hoping that Apple was going to come up with an Apple Watch S7 and I was going to be ready to buy it first because I wanted to start, you know, experimenting with it and see really its real value in healthcare. Uh, same thing with, uh, uh, you know, the, the latest uh, iPhone, for example. I thought that it was going to have uh, many more features that would have been a very um, exciting to 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 have a better you know um, facial recognition or not facial recognition but you know signing in uh, without the need to take your mask off you know without having an Apple Watch uh, that kind of stuff but I I really thought that they, they maybe they missed an opportunity and I saw it as a a new Apple uh, presentation that it was really targeted towards selling more devices and replacing devices that are already very good with devices that maybe are a little bit better, but, but right. not really, truly better. So I was really not excited to, 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 to hear what they uh, end up uh, announcing, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I agree. Let's hope that the next presentation is going to bring more value for digital healthcare. Yeah. Uh, I really wanted to ask you how the hospital you're working in reacts and supports all the de uh, technology you're trying to adopt in general in terms of the, ho the hospital. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I just started at a new hospital in, 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 uh, in a nearby state. I, for almost uh, 17 and a half years, I, I worked in Maine. And unfortunately, uh, uh, that hospital lost the opportunity. Uh, uh, 
tremendous opportunities to, to be in the forefront of the news, in the forefront of, uh, of, uh, of really innovation, true innovation in, in, in healthcare. Um, I did the first operation uh, there, obviously, and, 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 and uh, that was the next few hours after I did that, uh, the biggest news out there in the world, and they missed the opportunity to, to you know, take the, the, the take advantage of that, of that of that wave in order to get them out there a uh, very well known for for disruption for innovation and uh, over the next several years basically I started working in parallel to my hospital because they really lacked the vision uh, to to be innovators and uh, and really that was a tremendous loss for them I think uh, and someday they'll realize that about a, a three and a half months ago I started at a new hospital that seems to have that vision that vision vision of being, you know, creatively disruptive to be really leader in how a technology can be applied in a smart way in order to communicate and connect better to, to uh, really uh, change the, the, the landscape of how we do healthcare and how we teach healthcare. So um, we have a brand new sim center. Uh, we have uh, residency programs, a, a nursing programs. I'm really excited. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason that I came to this hospital is uh, precisely to, to be able to uh, tap that potential that is out there uh, with technology. You know, I'm much closer to Boston as well, which is a hub for technology. And uh, uh, so right now I haven't uh, uh, started uh, doing much, but uh, the, the possibilities here are real and the excitement and the vision that they have is also real. So. Uh, I'll let you know in a few in a few months uh, uh, what happens, but I'm really really uh, thrilled to be in this new place that really gets it. I think that's really exciting. Wish you luck with that. Uh, actually, but my next question is actually uh, not that uh, exciting because um, in the beginning of 2020, uh, in one of the monthly digests of healthcare news, uh, we made. Uh, I was saying that Microsoft stopped supporting Windows 7 and asked everyone, all the enterprises, to migrate to Windows 10, obviously. And that was like a huge problem for so many hospitals in America because that was supposed to might have some security breaches and stuff like that. So the question is uh, how to narrow that gap between like early adopters like you are and all the technology with the hospitals that most of them are not in a really hurry to adopt those technologies. How, what can be done to, to help them fast do the transition faster? Well, it's, uh, you know, I guess I don't have, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the magic answer. You know? Like anything, I think that it's a matter of, of uh, um, uh, learning, of educating ourselves, uh, uh, everyone, every player in that, in that equation that you're talking about is really important. And we have to work together in order to, to do things right. Because in healthcare, obviously, there are many, uh, you know, many things at stake, right? And not just privacy, but outcomes on patients or real human lives. And I think that that's, a, that's really very important. So, um, you know, I couldn't comment on, on the, the technicalities of, of that migration from Windows 7 to Windows 10, except what I, what I lived and, and, and what I read in the, in the news. But uh, I think that it takes a, a visionary healthcare system. It takes a, some a, a sort of... Uh, influencer, influencer champion physicians in a way because you do need the clinical part as well as a very strong visionary IT department working with the industry in order to, to really make healthcare what it should be in the 21st century. You know, it is a shame that we have to deal with the technology that we deal with on a daily basis to do 95% of the work that we do in healthcare. Uh, I'm only familiar with the US healthcare system and uh, with the healthcare system in Venezuela, which is where I come from, which I, I won't talk about that. But in the US, you know, we are in the 21st century. We, we are uh, sending civilians to, you know, to, 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 the, uh, 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 to the space and we're still 
a, a struggling with a, a sharing an x-ray a, a from a hospital a two miles away from us. A, we're st- struggling from, uh, you know, with, 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 with a, a electronic medical records that, that are not human-centered, a, a, that have a pretty bad user experience. We are struggling with the, the patient's user experience, engaging with their own medical records. We're struggling with uh, a, a, the, the, the fact that we have all these great devices that provide data, and there is no real use of that data in most cases, right? A, a, all those things are really frustrating, and I think that is because uh, we have focused uh, a lot in, in, in the money side of things. We're focused on maybe documentation and billing uh, more uh, that, uh, than in, 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 in actual uh, patient or provider experience. And, and that is the problem. And I'm hoping that, you know, with the next uh, uh, evolution of companies like Microsoft, for example, uh, companies uh, uh, that are creating uh, um, alliances, uh, for example, with Nuance and uh, uh, what, they, uh, what they call the uh, uh, ambience clinical intelligence, for example, for uh, having cameras and microphones and facial recognition and uh, artificial intelligent algorithms uh, learn uh, about a situation that you could have a physician, a provider, a nurse interact with a patient and uh, have that whole experience be uh, automatically populated to a medical record uh, with an AI algorithm that can you know, put everything in its place and where the physician or the nurse can focus on the actual patient in front of them rather than focusing in the computer, you know, on the side and, uh, and separating the two human beings that need to be you know, connected because that is what healthcare is about, connecting human beings to enhance, to prevent, to regain health. And uh, we have missed tremendous opportunities in the last few decades, I would say, and, and that certainly uh, it needs to, uh, to change. So, uh, but that doesn't happen unless you have a healthcare system that has got a vision, uh, uh, unless you have uh, providers that uh, can be champions and leaders in uh, uh, shaping and adopting and correcting that type of innovation, and also very strong internal, you know, IT people and industry partnerships that can really make all of that happen and all of that work. Thank you for that detailed answer. Let's really hope that happen really soon. Um, another question I wanted to ask you: In most of your interviews, you talk a lot about wearables, VR, AR headsets. What about software? Uh, what kind of software innovations do you frequently use? Any maybe products specifically you've discovered recently that actually can help your work? Yeah, well, I um, I guess I'm you know unfortunately I'm not a programmer or, or a software person. I'm, I'm pretty basic, right? But uh, I, uh, I I really been excited with uh, some of the software out there that is allowing us to uh, communicate to teleconference in a better way. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think we're all tired of, uh, of 2D screen, you know, uh, conferencing like this, for example, right? It's pretty sharp, it's pretty, uh, you know, uh, crisp, uh, the sound is good, the image is good, but we are really not there yet in regards to the possibilities, especially in the 21st century. If you look at uh, uh, technologies like um, spatial, for example, uh, 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 you know, the, or the, uh, the, the HoloLens, uh, um, um, application uh, to uh, do, you know, uh, avatar, uh, almost um, holographic or 3D conferencing uh, with uh, uh, the ability to uh, be in a place anywhere in the world, anytime, uh, talking uh, almost in person, but digitally uh, doing a presentation or showing a video or, or really uh, transporting your, your being almost to a conference room anywhere in the world, I am excited with that possibility. There's a company called Aethos, A-E-T-H-O, that has a product called Beam, B-E-A-M-E, that I have been trying you know, for the last year and a half or so. And, and I think that they have an incredible product that, that is going to, to, to be very revolutionary. And there'll be more to come later on that, but they use extended reality devices in order to allow you to sort of transport yourself in a way as an avatar, as a, as a 3D looking avatar, uh, using a, a, a augmented and 
really extended reality to connect uh, to anywhere in the world. That is the future of telecom, for instance. You have companies uh, like Portal, for example, that uh, allows you to, to, to project. It's not a holographic image, really, but it looks like a holographic 3D image. So, you know, I think the software behind those technologies is, is to me, really, really exciting because I think that Anything that improves how we connect and how we communicate will uh, uh, sort of hence uh, uh, intuitively improve how we do healthcare, right? I think that that's, that's really, really for me uh, exciting. A specific, uh, uh, you know, software out there, uh, you know, they, they, there are many. I, I couldn't really tell you that there's one that, that, uh, that uh, excites me uh, more than others, but uh, there's so much happening. And uh, I think that... Uh, 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 we still have to be very, very inventive and creative. I am starting a project uh, that is uh, tackling the, the electronic medical record uh, using all this uh, uh, hardware that we have available now in XR, and that's going to be really exciting, I hope. So let's imagine I'm a startup founder of some kind of medical device, and I've tested it here locally, for example. I got some uh, great feedback from local surgeons. And I'm thinking to move to American market. Um, what would you recommend? What are the first steps? Should I get the FDA approval first um, or maybe reach out to early tech adopters like you are and get feedback from you guys first? Or maybe talk to a specific hospital and organize some kind of trial period. What do you think? What is the best approach? Well, you know, the, the, the regulations in the U.S. are fairly tight, uh, as you know, and fairly expensive, right? So I think that anyone who wants to get into the, the digital health uh, uh, arena here in the U.S. Uh, certainly needs to have a, a product that, that is going to, to be helpful, right, to, to the US, U.S. healthcare. Uh, I'm a full-time surgeon, and at the same time, I have this parallel life almost where, where I get all these people connecting with me in order to, to advise about a product or to shape a product. And I am formal and informal, an advisor, a consultant, and a resource really for this type of situation, right? And I'm glad to do it because I love being part of that process of shaping something that is going to help at the end uh, our patients. Uh, I think that you definitely need some, some feedback from local uh, clinicians, from people uh, in the trenches who, who know the problems, who could tell you, you know, we should probably go this way or that way. And then once you, you have that, uh, obviously the, the main step in order to, to, to have any sort of presence in the U.S., is to have FDA approval. And as you know, uh, because of the, the last several months, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, there have been, a, I wouldn't say a, a relaxation of the, of the regulations, but uh, the regulations have become smarter. Uh, so that things that are more necessary are given priority and uh, uh, laws and regulations that were created you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago are being, are being reshaped in order to allow a, a, a products uh, that, that will uh, expedite care and uh, make care smarter. Uh, telemedicine, for example, you know, the, the, there's been tremendous advancements uh, in how the, the federal the government has allowed telemedicine to, to be done. And the same thing has happened with FDA products that are uh, in a way uh, accelerated uh, in the way they get uh, approved. So I think that you need both. You need uh, a, a local a clinical voices uh, uh, like myself or many others uh, who are also engaged with technology, who are sort of exponential tech thinkers, I guess, uh, or geeks, I would guess, uh, but uh, also uh, the FDA, uh, primarily the FDA. You cannot do a trial in a hospital without having FDA approval, right? Uh, you could have someone like me try. I'm always trying different prototypes of products, and I try it uh, not clinically on patients. I, you know, uh, I use it with, uh, uh, let's say, students or, or, or other providers or amongst ourselves, or I show it to patients and, and get their opinion. But obviously, I couldn't try or use any product clinically on a patient unless it was FDA approved. But that informal sort of experience uh, has a lot to say about you know, whether the product is going to be successful or not. And that way, I can you know, give advice or give you know, recommendations or, or just my feedback to a, a, someone who's trying to do a pitch uh, 
FDA and, and, and get all the documents ready in order to, to get their product approved. So yeah, those two components are key, I think. Thanks, that's very valuable. Uh, and thanks for clarifications. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, even though technology is aiming to make healthcare more affordable, for lots of reasons, it's getting more and more expensive. Uh, and as we all know, preventive healthcare right now is a new trend or a good forgotten trend. Uh, what, how technology can help with preventive healthcare specifically? Well, I, uh, you know, going back to wearables, right? I, I really think that there is tremendous power. Uh, uh, the amount of data that uh, a lot of people all over the world is producing, right, on themselves, on the on their uh, physiology, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, stunning, right? And I think that more and more we are seeing that data being used in order to, you know, uh, do preventive medicine, which is what we should be doing, right? Uh, we uh, we focus and have focus, you know, for. For, for centuries maybe, right, on treating things. We need to focus on the important part, which is preventing things so that we don't have to treat things. And if you look at products like, like Whoop, for example, right, and uh, the Whoop uh, 4.0, and I don't have any sort of, uh, you know, financial, uh, 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 you know, compromise with these companies, right, but uh, I just use and, and talk about products that are good. If you look at the Whoop uh, 4.0, which is uh, the device that uh, it measures your temperature, that measures your pulse oximetry, that measures your activity, that measures and analyzes all those uh, variables and also your sleep. Uh, if you put that in the context of uh, someone's health and how you're evolving and how you might create uh, having uh, artificial intelligent algorithms that somewhat, uh, and they're artificial intelligence, but, but in basic uh, artificial intelligence, right? Which is mostly what we have right now. Algorithms that can, uh, you know, recommend that you go uh, to bed earlier today because you didn't get enough uh, rested sleep, for example. Your hours of sleep were not good quality sleep, for example. Uh, so if you do that in a, in a chronic basis, imagine the power of that preventing you from getting sick. Uh, uh, so if you if you don't move, if you uh, uh, are sedentary, uh, you know, you get alerts on the Apple Watch or, or whatnot. If you have a product like the Aura, right, that, that has a very similar algorithms, you know, giving you not just data, but uh, analyzing the data and giving you recommendations like a preventive health coach, that's where we need to go. And I think we're getting there. And you see uh, how... You know, I, 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 Apple, uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, they're all getting into the healthcare arena because they know that the technology is there. We just have to be smart enough in order to put all that together to really get patients a, 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 where they need to be in regards to their health so that they don't get sick and then need treatment, which is very, very expensive, as, as, as you know. So a, 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 I'm really excited about, about that, about, you know, a wearable that is not just going to measure, but it's going to have an algorithm that is going to tell you, okay, you should do this instead of doing that. You shouldn't be drinking at night late because we see that your heart rate variability, you know, is, is pretty low or, or X or Y. You know, there are many many uh, uh, features out there that are really, really preventive. And uh, I, I think that that is certainly the future. I mean, there's no question that digital health, which is something that I promote and I'm very passionate about, uh, is about the integration of the hardware, the software, and the the, the thinking of, of, of how can this not just be fancy and cool looking or sexy looking, but this actually can be a healthcare tool that makes you healthier or that keeps you healthy. So that is the goal, I think, of digital health. And I'm very, very excited about that. For sure. And the last question for today, uh, could you give some recommendations for startup founders and digital healthcare specifically, or any piece of advice for them, especially on the early stages? <laughs> well, you know, I, I really... Um, I guess the best recommendation that I usually tell a startup companies is, you know, pitch your product to someone who can help you shape your product. I mean, obviously you need funding and you need money, right? And I'm not a business person at all. I'm not a marketer. I'm just a surgeon and a bit of a geek, I guess, like I said before. But, but I think that it's important that if you're going to get into healthcare, you need to pitch your product, your initial product uh, to someone who's uh, uh, living 
the issue, who's living the problem, who's living the nightmare, right? So that uh, you don't try to create a product just because you think it's, you know, elegant or, or is going to make a lot of money or this or that. If you are going to get into healthcare, you have to focus on the patient. You have to focus on the relationship between the provider, nurse, doctor, whoever that is, and the patient, how to improve the user experience. So if you early on in your idea phase of your product, you know, uh, you, you, you get that, then you have a, a tremendous chance of being more successful than, than if you don't. OK, uh, uh, you, know, you obviously need the money, you need all of that. But, but you know, unless you have a good idea that is clinically uh, is sound and that uh, is solving a problem, then I don't think that you're going to get many investors, uh, you know, uh, throwing dollars at you or whatever amount of <laughs> whatever uh, currency at, at you uh, in order to make it happen. Right? So get early, early on with the clinician so that the clinician can tell you what is the problem and try to guide you uh, the answer to that, that problem. You know, innovation is nothing without an impact, right? Innovation starts with an I and finishes with an I, I always say. Innovation, idea, you know, implementation, impact. You need to have an impact. In healthcare, you, the impact is the patient and the user experience of that patient and the physician or the provider, the nurse, but also uh, the outcome, right? It's all about that. Otherwise, you're not solving anything and you will fail. I think this is really important because this is like one of the biggest mistakes when startup founders just keep that step, not talking to clinicians and medical providers and just trying to create something without actually understanding the problem. Yeah, so- I, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but as a, as, a, as a clinician that I am, I feel very, very, uh, uh, you know, strongly uh, about being a communicator. So that's why I'm active in Twitter. That's why I'm active in uh, LinkedIn, you know, and, and, and that's the best way to connect to me and with many other physicians who like me are in this arena. To me, it's a responsibility as important as treating a patient, uh, the responsibility of communicating with the people like you, like startups, like people who are creating the tools for us to do better healthcare, better preventive and uh, 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 treating uh, healthcare. So uh, uh, don't be shy to, to connect uh, because I have a website, you know, it's my name.com, a website that, that uh, uh, allows me to establish that connection and that tells you a little bit about myself and how I can help. And I, you know, I, again, I'm not a business person. But my goal is to, you know, tap the power of all those variables in that equation that you mentioned in order to, at the end, have a better product, a better uh, outcome. And that's all uh, there is. I think that uh, it's, it's just very simple in my mind. Uh, you need to, to connect and communicate better in order to, to have success in this industry. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, that was great. Uh, I think you already left a great footprint in digital healthcare history, but please don't stop. Please continue to inspire people to adopt technology. The faster we do that, uh, the better and the new uh, concept of healthcare is going to appear. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It was my pleasure.